Dunbar, when did you go into the Navy and why? I joined the Navy on my birthday, my 18th birthday. Wow. And yeah. skipped school. And <laughs> oh, yeah. Didn't tell my parents. It was not very well thought out, probably. Yeah. But uh, so I went, took a bus into Chicago to uh, Navy enlistment office and signed up. Did it because they were drafting people in those days. So what year was this? Sixty six. Nineteen sixty six. Yeah. So you skipped school. Skipped school. Were you uh, was skipping school a, a normal thing for you? That's my only time. Oh, that's the only time the only you skipped. You skipped school. The only time I skipped school. Yeah. Well, so what was the thought process? Did you know you're going to do it the night before? Or did you wake up that morning? No, I probably thought about it for a week before yeah and just did it came home told my folks well I signed up for the Navy today <laughs> so, my mom took yeah. it pretty hard but my dad took it okay was he a veteran himself no no was he was an engineer who was during World War two oh, okay was in a critical yeah. area so they needed his expertise on the home front yeah they were drafting in and when is what month is your birthday April. So they were, the draft was on, of yeah. course. Um, and did you feel like it, it was inevitable you were going to get drafted and so you wanted to have you a little know, choice? You know, they go by date, the lottery, and yeah. uh, I wasn't really up close and I wasn't at the, I was sort of in the middle and I thought it probably would. So You probably would. Probably so you did. wanted to have a little more, a little more say over what happened? Yes. Mm -hmm. Um was part of that you know just thinking well it's 19 it's early 66 vietnam certainly is in the news not the way it's going to be right. in the next year yeah. and in the next couple years the next several years um was start of, part of your thinking process um you know i'm likely to you know I'm, at, I'm the perfect age to get pulled into this thing going on over in vietnam and i'd rather not be in the jungle so this is how yeah, I'll that was that's good way to put it I was thinking that I yeah. wasn't thinking much more than that I was done school yeah I was tired of learning so I knew I unlike my brothers who before me who went to college I wasn't going to do that you weren't going to do that mm -mm. but you ended up a university professor <laughs> so um, go figure in my case I uh, barely graduated from high school. You said you skipped school one day and that was the only day. I, I was a habitual sk mm -hmm. school skipper. And actually it's not right that I graduated. I should not have graduated because um, I didn't actually do very much at all. But they gave me the piece of paper anyway. I spent the next year trying to be a rock star. That didn't work. And so I went into the Navy. Mm -hmm. And uh, had I gone into the Navy, I mean, I'm sorry, had I gone to college right out of high school, I cer certainly would have failed because I didn't have any study skills. I would or have done the same thing, Preston. I was, yeah. my senior year, my grades were dropping, I, even to the point where I said, okay, I've got a A, it went from A to next period B, next period C, and I said to myself, let's see if I can go D. You know, all the F. way down. Yeah, all the way down in order, so. Yeah. You enlisted in Chicago? I did. And is that where you went to boot camp then? No, you would think that, but they got overcrowded at that time, and so they flew me to San Diego. So you went to San Diego. Had you been to California before? Never. My first flight. Yeah. What's your very first memory of, of boot camp? I, I know it's been decades, but do you remember kind of that first moment when you're in this world that you really can't anticipate. Yeah, I remember in a line with everybody else and they say, take this out and throw this away. Take this. You've got this, throw this away. Let's see what you've got. They're throwing stuff out. Left and right. Yeah. People yelling at you for no reason. Yes. Yeah. And I think when you went through boot camp, it was uh, probably a little tougher than when I went through in the, in the yeah, late 80s. I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, what was your job in the Navy? I, on the ship, I was a boatswain's mate. So you became a boatswain's mate? A sailor, mate. I became a boatswain's mate. Was that the plan from the outset? No, no. 
uh, I really had no particular plan. I didn't know what I wanted, but yeah. when I took the test, I did well in languages. So they said, if you want to get to language school, that has to be your first, second, and third choice. So that's the only thing I had, and I got into the language school. You got into language school? Yeah. And was the plan then to go to, to the language school in Monterey, California? That's correct. That's where I went. So you went there to I Monterey? Did. I went. Uh, it was a Spanish. Yeah. And I got all the way through. I got my orders for Homestead, Florida. Uh, but huh. the security clearance did not get. And so they... Okay. Cancel those orders. So I want to come back to that, but um, we've had conflicts with Spanish-speaking countries back in eighteen, the eighteen forties, and the eight, in the eighteen nineties. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember what the rationale was for? Because presumably there are a lot of native Spanish speakers living in the states at the time and in the navy. Yes. What, what was the What was the rationale for needing more Spanish speakers in the and navy? That, that they time? would train one. I'm not sure. Yeah. You know, Homestead, Florida is the very tip of Southern Florida, and uh, yeah, and I'm sure it was listening in on Cuba. Oh, okay, right, yeah, that's that's where it would be. Yeah, and there was there was a a military incident in the Dominican Republic as well around that time. Yeah, U.S. Marines went in to the yeah, Dominican I remember Republic. That, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, was some time after that, but still. Yeah. Yeah, they listened to chatter. Okay, so how long were you in Monterey learning Spanish? Yeah, uh, six months. It was okay. a six-month program. It worked out for you in the long run because I know you still operate in Spanish. With yes, I do. But yeah, as a lawyer, I had to relearn a lot. Yeah, when it, but it was an excellent school. I have no complaints about that. And yeah, they treated me well, and when I didn't get the clearance, they, they, uh, yeah, still treated me well. Oh, I hung out since I could. I was done with the language school and I had no place to go, so I went to the Navy Postgraduate School, which is attached to Monterey, same Presidio. Yeah. And my job was to put the lines on the Little League baseball field and rake it. So, uh, <laughs> that was your job. So it was just me. I think there yeah. were like six enlisted men and you know three thousand officers. You know, so I spent the <laughs> just you whole day doing worked that. your your right shoulder muscles pretty well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so you said that you were losing interest in school and your grades were falling, yeah. uh, but then after boot camp, you find yourself in this highly cerebral context of language immersion did you enjoy that yes i did it was yeah. different I, it was so uh yeah and very different experiential yeah yeah uh, we had teachers from a dozen different spanish-speaking countries so you said you didn't get a security clearance so i don't want to dig too much in your personal life but do you know why uh, Are you willing to, totally to say sure. why? No, okay. but I can say something. I yeah. don't mean it. I think it's perhaps a good decision by the government because I was really green and naive and I, I didn't know my mind. However, my grandfather was one of the earliest union organizers uh, out west and my father was a member of the Communist Party for a while. So. Oh, I, I'm guessing that's it then. It might have. Oh, so your dad was, I mean, your grandfather was an early union organizer and your dad for a while was a member of the Communist Party. Yeah. Was that back in the 30s? It was back when, you know, Russia was the place that took care of workers. And, yeah. And uh, yeah. now it wasn't too long when, you know, Lenin and Stalin gets in and you realize that, or my dad said, we realized that this is country's crazy so yeah yeah he stopped it. wow yeah I would guess that that would probably be Might have, in yeah. the 60s so then so they say okay the linguist thing which of course is going to involve intelligence work you know right. that's, that's going to involve yeah. intelligence work that that's not going to work and I'm, I'm I think your thesis is probably probably right because you've yeah. got you know communists in your in your you know in your family um, so, so how do you go from that to boatswain's mate? Do they give you choice, or did they just say this no, is it? No, it's like you. I had my training. Yeah. We get one school, so I had it, and so 
the, actually they are always short of deck force people because there's right. so many trained people yeah and so once i got on the ship it was like i wasn't going to get out of deck force yeah so they didn't send you to, to bosun's mate school or anything they no, just sent you actually, right to the I'm fleet no actually i'm not even sure there is a bosun's mate school it's something that that the qualifications are heavy drinker and loud cusser you know something <laughs> like that that'll get a lot done <laughs> yeah so you're in uh did you actually go to florida no never got okay to, no, canceled i bought my my scoop my snorkels and fins and, but uh, but never got to you never them. got to you were you in monterey when you found out about the clearance yeah and so from monterey where did you go uh, flew to Flor uh, Hawaii and got on the ship. Okay, and what ship was it? It was the USS Maury, M-A-U-R-Y. What kind of ship was that? It was a survey ship, they call it. So it was fairly big, uh, maybe 450 feet. Yeah. And uh, we carried wooden sound boats, fairly big wooden sound boats on the deck and the job was for uh, to have the main ship anchored at sea, have a marine land base, and then the ships would go up and down, and that's the triangulation. So they'd go up and down along the coast of Vietnam, and as they did that, they took oceanographic depths. So we made charts. And so this was for in case there needs to be an, some sort of invasion That's force correct. or something like That's that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So by this time, by the time you get to the Maori, then are we in early '67 or mid '67 by this 67. point? '67. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have to back off on Pearl. I don't think I. I think we flew directly to Subic. I flew directly to. Subic. Oh, you flew directly to Subic. Okay, yeah. from Monterey. Yeah. Or from. Wherever yeah. you flew out of from California. Yeah. And you pick up your ship then in Subic, and then you are on your way to the um, yes, to yes. the South China Sea. Right. Yeah. Um, how long would you would you be out there in the South China Sea doing these um, operations? Well, from then, as you, and you were correct in saying it was about April, uh, early April when I went to the Philippines and got on the ship and stayed there so stayed on the Maori until 68 so ended near the end of 68 so a year and a half and a lot of that year and a half are you out there in the Almost east in all the south except for one trip back to Pearl that's what I remember and then back to yeah uh, what kind of work know. are you are you doing as you know as you kind of indicated a boatswain's mate does a lot of different yes. things they're sort of the handymen of the of the navy yeah. and they're doing all kinds of things what what sort of things did you so do so i'm not a boatswain's mate yet a boatswain's mate you're not really a boatswain's mate until you're rated you know the e4 and uh so you're just on the deck for it. so i was a sweeper and paint chipper and and yeah. cook helper and yeah things so it was yeah whatever type of work they had for me to do so it was sure. so it was the type of thing that like this is going nowhere let's see if i could transfer it off to something else and did you try to do that oh i did several times yeah what, what did you want what, what did you want to do oh anything <laughs> anything uh, <laughs> anything because it was yeah. it was mindless work mm. And uh, was this kind of an awakening for you? I mean, even just that word you use, mindless, because yeah. I'm going back to you saying high school, things weren't going well, I was fed up with it. But then you find yourself in this very cerebral environment in Monterey, yeah. and now you're finding the mindlessness of this work yeah. you're doing is getting I'm, at you. I'm not awakening yet. It was pretty, kind of went into mindless mode, and you, you know kind of how it is. It's yeah. Uh, two different people will tell you, order you to do two opposite things, and you just have to go do it until the next guy yells at you. Right. And says, yeah, the rule is follow it. the most recent order you got. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Yeah. So it's kind of like that. And so. Yeah. Did you ever learn this trick? A trick we learned, or I learned in the Navy, 
was when you're walking around and you don't want people to harass you, walk around with a dustpan in your hand, no. a, a dustpan and a dust brush, because it makes you look like you're on your way to do something. And see, no, I do. You I never learned that didn't trick. Didn't do that. I'm <laughs> yeah. So you're there in the the South China Sea. Of course, when you're there in '67, the war really is ramping up. It is. Um, did you have any inklings of that on the ship? I mean, did you ever hear anything, see anything that reminded you that, you know, however secure it may be here on the Maori, um, they're actually not very far from here. There's a pretty nasty conflict going on. A little bit. Not much. You can see explosions happening on the sh land and the shore from our ship. You could see So you that. can see fighting going on. You can see tracers. Uh, one time, one of our sound boats was hit with a shell but did not explode but it was below the water line so they had to run ashore and we had to uh, do a rescue operation on that but that was really the only time anything was shot at our ship yeah. Were you were you part of that operation or were you able part, to Part, but yeah, I was just I wasn't on the boat. They got hit and th it was everybody was involved in the rescue part, but uh, I I think my job was to pull out a line to help bring things up and down. Yeah. You said a few minutes ago that rather than doing what you were doing, you'd be willing to do anything. Would that include did you ever have you know, thinking back that thought of I you know, maybe I would actually like to be on land right now, and maybe I'd be interested in being over there on land doing what they're doing rather mm -hmm. than being on this boat. We carried some Marines who uh, who did the shore stuff, the land stuff. So yeah. anytime we stopped and did charts and we anchored over here, the Marines took us the land spot and then and the sailors uh, sailed us sound boats up and down. I volunteered one time, before I knew what I was doing, I volunteered for a PBR, a patrol boat river duty. You did? Yeah, trying to get out. But they, you know, they turned that down. And I can't say I knew what I was doing. It certainly wasn't heroic. It was the more dangerous sure. journey for Navy. Yeah, definitely. So it was yeah. like a PT boat. Exactly. Yeah, no, that is dangerous duty. Yeah. Looking back, are that are you glad they turned you down? Yes, and it's not so much out of danger. I wasn't into. I wasn't through with my concept of what am I doing with war and and going out and shooting at people and killing them and why am I doing that? And then, of course, you know, later you find out that the. What, the Bay of Tonkin, was that it? Where the Gulf of Tonkin, Gulf 64, of Tonkin yeah. Turned out to didn't happen the way they said, and it's like, oh man, they lied to me, and and now I'm here killing people for, for what reason? So this was kind of my, well, let me see what happens if I go on a river boat and shoot at people, see what happens. I don't, but I was really naive and ignorant, and I didn't know what I was doing. So at the time, you were kind of conflicted, like, you yeah, know, like I, I want to be here, right. I don't want to be here, or I think this is okay, I don't think this is okay. Well, and I didn't get the okay and not okay. I wasn't making value judgments, perhaps, for anything else. I was just trying to think, can I shoot at somebody? What should I shoot at somebody? Is this a good idea? Why am I shooting at somebody? Uh, These were thoughts you were having. Yeah, I was having all that, but I didn't work those out really until after the Navy. Do you remember discussing this with anyone else on the ship? Not on the... Kept no, it to yourself? No. Yeah. No, I did. You know, I, I did sometimes talk about some of those things. And I remember when I left and I was transferred out, one of my buddies says, well, who's going to search for the capital T truth if you're not here? <laughs> so that, in a way, that was their making light fun of me of uh, that. Well, are you designated as the Maori philosopher no, or the, no, or the, no. the Socrates too of the stupid, Maori? stupid, really. No, there were, some there were some college guys on our deck for us. Yeah. 
they were much better. They kind of helped, I shouldn't say nobody did, because they kind of guided me. Yeah. Huh. When you look back on this, that experience of being in the military, you just did the one enlistment, right? You just did the I, one enlistment? I, I just in the Navy. Yeah. You look back on that time, um, you know, what does it mean to you now, looking, looking back on it? I guess two questions, you know, what does that period mean to you now? Because you were in, you were in the world of war, you yeah. weren't actually in combat itself, but you were in the world of war, and it sounds like, you know, that triggered some conflict within your own mind. Um, so looking back on that time, sort of what does that whole time mean to you now? And then more broadly, what is your perception of what that time means to the country all these decades yeah. later? Okay, for me, it was a place to grow up. I was amazingly naive about the world. Uh, had you, you said when you lived in Chicago that you hadn't been to San Diego before. Had you ever been out of the country before? No, I've never flown on a plane. I've never. You've never been on a plane? No, never. So in a really short period of time, you're in a new state, very different environment. Yeah. Now you're in a plane for the first time. Now you're in a Longapo, which is a completely different world. Yeah. We'll get to Longapo in a little bit. Yeah. Now you're in the South China Sea. You're seeing these... Um, uh, you know the what, what's the right, not lasers? What's the the tracers, uh, the tracers right mm -hmm. in battle and all that? It's a lot to take in in a pretty short short period of time in life. Yes, and I'm not thinking. Remember, I I was kind of on mental hold too for a while, so not really analyzing very well. Certainly, don't have many people to bounce things off of on mm. it. It was a wakening up time. But it wasn't just about war. I don't think I understood, changed my war views until much later. Uh, but it, I did wake up to, I could be, I could just accept this and do it. And, uh, I was really pretty uh, unaccepting. I didn't like it. I was unaccepting of this. And when I say I was a boatswain's mate, actually here's what happened. I was kind of just bouncing around doing mindless things, being mindless. And I woke up one day and realized that I had kind of taken over the line locker and organized it and kept it and tied those things. And I did these things. And I remember one time I... Uh, for my petty officer was over me, I made a splice, an eye splice, and gave him, he said, whoa, well you made an eye splice, what'd you do that for? And I explained what I was working on over there, and he said, oh, and he started, give him credit for it, he started giving me more stuff, responsible stuff to do, and I just did it, and it was just kind of like, I went from off to on, my evaluations, we had weekly evaluations. They were, they were always from, this is the type of person we want to ship over to uh, the kitchen. You know, to right. Bala suddenly turned around, evaluation. I was trying to think, was I ever the Seaman of the Month award? And I did <laughs> not. <laughs> but I was recommended for it. And like my second to last month there. Mm. Was that a kind of a feeling and you know, a feeling of accomplishment? Like, you it, know, for the first time you felt like you'd gotten me. recognition for something. It helped me because I was going to be transferred off. It helped me say that this whole experience wasn't total goof off failure. Yeah. When you look back on that enlistment in the Navy now, are you glad you did it? Oh yeah. It was, I grew up there. I had to grow up somewhere, and I was going to grow up. I wasn't going to do it in college. I don't know what I was going to do. Yeah. yeah. Do you, I'll ask the question, then I'll tell you why I ask it. Um, you know, because it sounds like you're describing a little bit of, you know, kind of being disoriented as a young person, sort of, you know, what's going on here? Why am I here? And all this mm -hmm. stuff, and what's my place in the world? And the reason I asked you about your memory of boot camp is I have a very clear memory of 
my foot stepping off the bus, this was at Great Lakes, I went to Great Lakes, my foot stepping off the bus onto that asphalt at the Great Lakes basic training and people are yelling at me, bald-headed people who only, I didn't realize at the time, had only been in boot camp like three weeks yes, longer than yeah. I had. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, why are these bald-headed people my age yelling at me for reasons I've, you know, I, I don't understand? And just feeling completely disoriented. Yeah. And of course that was a terrible feeling and, and I think I've kind of been disoriented ever since. But I would, I would definitely, you know, if somebody said, well, you can get rid of that memory, I'd say, no way. Yeah, I, I want right. to keep that memory forever. Um, it's hard to explain. Like this, like, you know, one of the best things I remember about the Navy is that feeling of disorientation and just having to get through it. But yeah. does that make sense to no, you? No, it does. Yeah. It does because uh, in a way, you're s staying disoriented means that you're not sure you you buy into the instant justification of why everybody's yelling at you and why the, they're trying to control your life and trying mm. to do all that and you kind of say no I think I can control my life yeah From, yeah uh, but yes and I like being different uh, and it probably mm. helped me but I must admit I learned a lot of skills and important things that I had to learn before I married Judy, who taught me all the ever <laughs> all the other things in life that I yeah, had to learn. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you mentioned, you know, you, you like being different, and yeah. you know, um, of course, the military is not not a very no. good place for people no. like that. Which is why I think for people like you and me, it was. Uh, I mean, for me, it was um, four years of almost relentless misery. But I'm so glad I did it because yeah. it forced me to just put up with a whole lot of stuff I otherwise wouldn't have had to put up with, you know, yeah. which is good for you. It you is. Know, to a I certain degree. To, it wasn't, and I had to learn that, oh, I can handle this when people yell at, yell at me. And also you recognize they're not yelling at you, or they weren't yelling at me because they were mad at me, which is why everybody else used to yell at me. But right. but now it's just because that's what you're supposed to do. And it was like, oh, oh, okay. Yeah. But it took me a long time to learn that. I was disoriented mm. probably longer than you yeah. were. But yeah. So speaking of disorientation, let's come to, you mentioned being in Subic Bay a couple times, the yeah. naval base, the Marines were also there. And... Uh, and then you cross from Subic Bay, there's a short bridge you cross across a, na a river with a certain name. I don't know if you remember the name they gave to that river or not, but um, you cross the river and then you're in, you're in, you're in, you're in the city of Alangapo. Um, I'm, I'm really, I've, I have a long-standing fascination with borders and how you're walking from one reality into another reality, different laws, different governors. Up in Canada, you know, different languages, you cross the border yeah, from one yeah. province into another. Um, that border between Subic Bay and Alangapo is, I mean, just an incredible experience because you've got the order and the rules and the regulations yeah. and the relative tranquility of a Navy base and then you cross a short bridge and now you're in the utter chaos of Alangapo. Yeah. And that was disorienting. And uh, you know, this interview isn't, you know, you're not interviewing me, so I, I want to be quiet here, but crossing that bridge and I just remember a certain sight I saw on that bridge just was also disorienting. Yeah, I'd never seen anything like that in the States. and. Uh, you know, and that really threw me, and in a way I've never really recovered from that either, you know, that whole, just what I saw on the bridge and then what you experienced in, in Alangapo. Just one last thing before we get to talking about it, I mean, uh, my sense was that Alangapo and other places that Navy ships went to, and maybe especially Thailand, the rule was kind of like Vegas, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, what happens yeah. in Alangapo stays in Alangapo, what happens in Pattaya stays in Pattaya. Uh, Thailand um, and I broke the rules when I got out of the Navy I came home and did a lot of writing about it I was really 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 bothered by the things I saw along a Pone Patia yeah and so 
Does any of that resonate with you? See, as you know, the thing yeah. is, when you're talking to Navy vets who've been there, you don't have to say anything specific. You can just speak in these general yes. terms, and everyone knows. But does that resonate with you? What I'm saying? It does. Uh, uh, so, f so first of all, remember, I was in Subic when we got on the ship. I hadn't been to. Uh, you hadn't been to Longa Po yet. Longa Po yet. Yeah. So, you know, I was on the top bunk of six you know bunks yeah. so I'm right under the floor you know the deck of the one above me and guys are coming back from Alonapo on leave you know so I remember uh, hearing two guys I could hear them coming back on ship two guys drunk cussing at each other calling all kinds of names you know, I had never heard before talk about uh, culture differences you know I said looking whoa all these things and mm -hmm. then one guy says yeah well you're a punk and he said punk and I hear Ksh, boom you know right in front of me boom and then his mouth get off him punk Ksh, Ksh, punk and he said he called me punk boom boom you know I'm thinking all right note to self don't call anybody punk you know this is right after you get to the ship from the Maori this because I right because I it was night it was like midnight when this is happening and yeah. I haven't had my first day yet on the ship and it's like okay what is wow. this going on so like it, I didn't get leave until maybe two more days yeah and then I w uh, and we worked all day then so you didn't get off until six so I went with somebody who took me under his wing he said I'll show you what to do here so we we crossed, we went into a long pole, and you're right, only one street is on limits. Everything else about the city. Yeah, is Meg, it's Megsese Boulevard, right? Just cross the bridge and go straight, basically. Yeah, that's that's Megsese Boulevard. That one street, and it's just yeah. nightclub, at, and all I have women. So we went to one. And uh, so, and of course, you know what it's like. You, you sit down at the table, and then the girls come and want you to buy them drinks. And, uh, and so, I was okay, but I was really cheap, by the way. Uh, and, you know, uh, combat duty for an E3, I got $90 a month, and I sent 50 home. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so I was really cheap, and oh, and these little drinks. Uh, it was also, by the way, the first time I probably had anything other than a beer. All right, so uh -huh. I had, I might have had one and bought three for the girl and then uh, nursed that as long as I could and my, my buddy then said well let's go to this next one and I said and w so what it's like so he goes in and looks and it was exactly the same thing the th yeah. same so I said okay I said I'm going back so I went back by myself and that was my entire Alangapo experience um, yeah I felt I was touched by the girls, the women. You know, they were. I thought, why would you don't they mean touch emotionally touched? Yeah, emotionally touched. Yeah. Oh, you were. That's yeah, what you I mean, was emotionally. Emo touched. I was emotionally touched by. I was like, why are they? Why would they do this? You know, uh, uh, sit with a guy so that he buys drinks, and then, and until he gets drunk and and acts the way he does so after that you know there was this island in the middle of the bay which was sort of a recreational island and I did snorkeling that was all my other Subic Bay experiences was snorkeling yeah so there are you know different schools of uh, thought about Alangapo uh, you know you'll hear some vets who say that place was paradise you know, mm -hmm. all the beautiful girls and everything. Uh, others say uh, that place was just a, a nightmare, yeah. you know, just a disaster. Um, it sounds like you're, you lean more towards the, the second, the latter. Yes, there. there certainly wasn't anything right I wanted. And I realized, I thought this was a place that is here just to get money and and uh, they don't mind using the girls to do it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So we don't need to go into details. I mean, obviously there's a lot of drinking going on. I mean, were you aware of yeah. you know that the girls weren't there just to right? Yeah, just to yeah, they, be companions I, at the drinking table. They, yeah. as I was told all that you know, they give you all kinds of lectures to watch out for this, but yeah. the girls for my buddy and was there with me. They never pushed for anything, and maybe it's because we sent signals. Although my buddy and his girl were were kind of going hot and heavy, but yeah. But I that's yeah. My girls yeah was she asked me questions and wanted to know, and I asked her questions. So yeah. One of the things I mean that really bothered me at that time. And you know, I think this applied to Thailand as well, but more along Po for some reason. Um, is at the time I, I didn't understand. Well, you know, one of the things I realized, I'm not sure it was conscious, but I realized it was how much power I had when I crossed that bridge. Mm. When I was on when I was on the base at Subic, I was a little E3, yeah, you know, E4 you know, almost no power. As an E4, you've got minimal power, right? Yeah. Um, no one's impressed by an E3 or an E4. I cross that bridge and all of a sudden I have a lot of power because the ship has been at sea for a few months. We're getting paid, there's nothing to buy. So I've yeah. got a pocket full of money. Mm -hmm. I've got the American flag behind me. Um, one night I was sent out on shore patrol, zero training. They gave me a baton, a shore patrol thing, and sent me out. I had no idea what I was doing. But, uh, you know, presumably I could have... There was one guy who came at me with a snake, and I told him if you get any closer to me with that snake, I'm going to let you have it with this baton, and he backed yeah. off. Um, but I just I felt like I had tremendous power, that as a 19, 20-year-old American, I could pretty much... Yeah. Get short of killing somebody, I could pretty much get away with anything. And all the stories that you hear about, you know, I don't know what it was like at your time, but the stories you hear about, you know, renting, effectively yeah. renting girls, some of them quite young, for days at a time. And I always wondered, you know, I thought, you know, well, what are we doing out here? This is my, my era yeah. is the Cold War. Of course, your era is too. Your yeah. earlier Cold War and later Cold War. So what are we doing out here? Well, we're protecting democracy. And I thought, isn't this kind of contradictory? Because out on the sea, we're protecting yeah. democracy, but then we come in here and... Yeah. It just doesn't look very good. It was... You know? The contradictions I wasn't in touch with until... Out of, I was out of the Navy. When I was out is the time when the anti-war stuff happened. I was in college when Kent State happened. 1970? Yeah. Yeah. So, Were you among those vets who, um, you know, of course, famously, you've got the Vietnam veterans against the war. Yeah. And these would be mostly, I think, that we think of combatants, these guys who come home and say, I know what it's like to be out in the jungle, I know what it's like to be in a firefight and the Vietnam vets against the war. Yeah. Were your sympathies with them by that point or still yes, not yet? Yes, but I didn't join any. That's another issue later of how much do I proactively work now to fight against it. Because I, yeah, I was 20 only when I got out. And, uh, wow, yeah. So I was still naive and still figuring things like that out. Yeah. Do you describe yourself as a pacifist now? I, I'm not good with words to define me, but yeah. yes. Okay, and that you'd be in that general, I would. that general camp. Do you think you would have, there's no way to know this for certain, but, um, but do you think you would have, you know, come to this place without your military service, or do you think the military service helped you to arrive at this place? Oh, I imagine it helped make me what I am. Uh, but it, I can't really say, well, I look back at my military experiences, and that now that I see it in the light, that's what 
makes me anti-war is probably many other things besides that. Yeah, yeah. Reading about Gandhi and other methods. I mean, uh, other methods of conflict handling you know, besides hitting somebody and killing them. Mm, yeah, yeah. What would you say to, uh, you know, what would you say to a 17-year-old kid today who just happened to find out you served in the Navy said, and he said to you, hey, I'm thinking of, you know, enlisting. Yeah. Um, what would you say to that young person? Now, that's a good question. Uh, I have I've told people that it's a good place to grow up. I agree with and, that. Uh, I like the uh, army experience and the military experience, the discipline. It's good to learn. But it's combined with going and supporting a s system that helps one powerful person kill less powerful people. Yeah, and I would explain that. I did. You know, you're, the trouble with kids 17 coming out of high school, again, they're even perhaps more naive than I was back then. And it's, uh, they're going to have to have some experiences with life. It's nice to get a lot of it in a short period of time. That's what the military does. Yeah, you've described that. I mean, in yeah. your own case. Yeah. No question about it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And it is true. You know, people say, you know, the ordinary person, you know, watches history happen. And if you're in the, if you're in the military, you have a good chance of participating in yeah. it. Yeah. And which says something about the human condition. You know, but you did participate in the big historical story of the second half of the 1960s. When you see the Vietnam vets at the local stores with their, you know, the Vietnam hats on, yeah. do you identify with them? I in do. Any way? I do. Uh, yes. And actually, I, all the vets, you know, people who think if you're a pacifist, you're betraying our men in uniform. And it's not that at all. It's like, boy, I am defending them, <laughs> you know. Let's get them out of Afghanistan and let's get them home. Yeah. Mm. No, but actually, let's see if I can tell this story. It was quite a bit after. It was after the, uh, not long after the Gulf War. So Judy and I were driving in Texas and we were in this one town that obviously it was right after and there war heroes had come back and they had a little parade and it was God bless our Gulf War heroes God, and it was all those and I'm really grateful for them I think that's good <laughs> I'm amazing how this touches me here got all the way through town one little sign at the end said Vietnam vets we appreciate you too mm -hmm. and I I just broke into tears there, and I cry every time I tell that story. It was, and it's like, boy, I never realized the emotions that I had there that were uh, mm -hmm. coming back. Because when, of course, when we came back, it was, uh, one group was saying, you're the heroes, and the other one saying, you're the murderers, you know, so. Mm hmm I hear you. And I, th I think what I'm also hearing you say, you know, there are the people who give the orders, and then there are the 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds who have to carry out the orders. Yeah. And it's if I, I'm interpreting what you're saying, make a distinction. That's correct. A lot of these 18, 19-year-olds are in the military because the, not all of them, but some of them are in the military because they really didn't have a lot of, a lot of other options. Um, others did out of sincere feelings of patriotism, commitment, family duty, whatever. They're there. I hear, is that kind of, is that something yes. else you're saying? Make and, a distinction. I didn't have the, I didn't have a great social class distinction on the ship. I mean, their ship had all different classes, different races, and, uh, it was, it was, it was very family, my group, uh, the group that 
drinks hard and cusses together, stays together. You know, yeah. it was it was a good group. Yeah. Uh, but I think I think it's not an accident that we aim at this group that is least likely to have thought about stuff and to cause trouble. They want people to just we tell you to go out there and shoot, you go shoot. And it yeah. is the ethical issue for the government is do you really want to take the responsibility in uh, taking this vulnerable group and make them do the things of power that you would like to do, even mm -hmm. including killing other people. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I like the idea, of course there's no way to put it into practical effects, but I like the idea of the only people who have the power to send other people's kids to war are people whose own kids will go with them yeah. into war. At least there's some personal buy-in in that respect. That powerful story you just told, um, yeah, I was just looking at something yesterday from the Gulf War. I was looking at buttons that came out at the end of the Gulf War. The yellow ribbons, you remember the yellow ribbons? Sure, yeah. And I worked at a psychiatric facility at the time, and one of the ways we spent time was by writing notes to just random soldiers, oh, yeah. random Marines. I've talked to veterans who served in the Gulf War. They said they were just inundated with gifts and cookies and cards and so much appreciation from the American people. And then, you know, and that was everywhere. Um, but And you saw that, but then you yeah. saw that one little sign and welcome to our Vietnam vets as well. Yeah. Yeah. And what is it about that that's that's so touching to you? Just that sense of, you know, here's a generation, because that Gulf War was very yeah. short, yeah. and it was overwhelming. Sure. Yeah. It was very short, and in terms of casualties, you know, low, certainly compared to Vietnam, for example. Um, a much longer war. What is it about that that makes it such a touching thing well, to you? For um, people, you know, the, in the United States, it was short, we win, uh, we get to be heroes, uh, we feel like we accomplished something. You know, it was high casualties on Vietnam. No, on the uh, Iraq. Oh, on the Iraqi Iraqis. side. High sure. Iraqi casualties. I mean, they dropped those those air sucking <laughs> bombs. I forget what that sure. is. Yeah. Uh, well, there's one. I mean, one of the famous images is the Highway of Death, right? Yeah. Where those Iraqis they're all are trying to escape, trying to get yeah. out of Kuwait. Yep. Yeah. 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 Vietnam, of course, was harsher. Yeah, it was in the jungle. Mm. Last longer. It's very similar to Afghanistan. Under, uh, yeah. So even though, in a lot of ways, I mean, you're, of course, you can't generalize. You know, well, yeah. you can generalize, but you recognize that within broad groups, you can have a lot of differences. But where we are, you know, most of the Vietnam vets who wear, you know, the the hats, probably on certain questions. You're going to be in a different place than they will be. Yeah. But you still, you very much identify with them. I as appreciate these them. Yeah, because what they had to go through. Uh, yeah. What they thinking? You know, everyone thinks different, especially people who had combat. And uh, uh, there are, I can't begin to put myself in their shoes and and appreciate what they went through. Is there one big lesson that you learned? For example, as I look back on my Navy service, I think one, one lesson I learned is that there's really, there's, there's high value in just really hating what you're doing for, f for several years. <laughs> and, just, and just having to live with it. Just having to put up with it because you yeah. don't have another choice. You know, yeah. if you're going to keep living, you got to keep going and because your enlistment's not up for two years and so you just have to deal with it and that's a lesson i learned that there's value in that kind of i wouldn't want to live yeah. an entire life like that but there's value in that kind of experience that's a lesson there I is, came away with. that is what, is there a lesson you you come away with i in a way i did the opposite okay in that mm. 
even though I functioned well at the, just at the end, you know, and I think God was merciful for me and he gave me the squared away, that's the term yeah. that we use, squared right. away experience. However, uh, uh, the here's one of those moral issues and ethical issues that the military deals with and that is strong drug thing and of course the drug of choice for the military is alcohol and and I was I got drunk really bad one time threw up and it was like this is terrible I have this hangover I'm never going to do this again that was stupid Okay, so I didn't do that, but I got into other drugs in Hawaii. Other drugs mm. were available, and I was <clears throat> I was re I was doing an LSD trip on the ship. Oh my goodness! When somebody re reported when my friends say hey, he's on LSD, and they oh, wow. took me away, put me in the in the, uh, the brig? medical bay. Oh, no, medical bay. Okay. Actually, quite interesting. But they just wanted, they didn't know how to handle me or what to do with me. And uh, <clears throat> so they went to, I was in Hawaii, so they went to shore, went through some psyche. Yeah. You were at sea? No. It, uh, when you were on we, the LSD we in, trip? No. We you were, you were in port, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. That's where I got the stuff. And, okay, in yeah. In Hawaii. And so, so they sent me out to the base, though, at land and you know, went through a group of psychiatric exams and everything like that, and and they just said, "Look, you can mess up your life. Don't do it." Oh, I have I have one wonderful story that comes up. However, it was like, why not? And so I was upfront with everything. I said, "This is what I'm doing here," and I was thinking they're going to discharge me. I said, "Okay, they'll discharge me." Now here's this wonderful thing. The captain was from not a hometown not far from where I grew up. He calls me in and he said, uh, what's this I hear? Uh, I had no idea this was going on with you. And he says, you know they will discharge you and they want to discharge you. And he said, but that's not the thing that bothers me, is that bothers me is that you're on the drugs and it's going to ruin your life. Which is an interesting thing. He does not yell at me. So uh, he says, he says, if you promise to not do drugs anymore, I will not process this. Okay, this thing. And I said, well, if I promise, I'll keep my promise. And he said, I know you will. So that vote of confidence in me uh, was enough to make me say, okay. So I said, all right, I won't do drugs anymore. And I didn't do drugs after that. So that was a turning point in your life. It was. This was the captain who said that to you? Who did that to you? Yeah. The chaplain was a good guy, but it was the captain who rescued me. Who rescued you? He did. Now, interesting thing. He didn't process it, but the people on shore processed it. So I was still discharged. I was discharged early. That's why I only have two and a half years in the Navy. So, so the captain wasn't able to step in to... No. But he, he helped. He helped a lot because uh, instead of a dishonorable discharge, I got a fitness discharge under honorable conditions. I'm sure of that. But that interaction you had with him was a life-changing event for you. It did. See, that's very interesting, Don, because um, close to when I was getting out of the Navy, despite everything I've said, how utterly miserable I was the whole time, with the one exception of watching the planes come and go off that, off that aircraft carrier. I would often work up on the bridge. A lot of times guys didn't like working up there because that's where the captain was. It was a stressful environment. I didn't mind being up there and I would just watch those planes come and go off the flight deck. I never got tired of that. That was always just awesome. Apart from that, though, everything else was horrible. Yeah. Uh, but before I got out, I didn't know what I was going to do. Yeah. I had taken a college class and gotten an F. 
I had taken a few other classes and had not done particularly well. Um, so I was nervous and uh, I went to the chief, um, Chief Keith, who's a great guy, and although I didn't appreciate him at the time, and I said, Chief, I'm, I think I'm thinking about re-enlisting. And he knew that, you know, when I was supposed to be looking at the radar screen, I was actually studying French notes, like notes yeah. in French. I was teaching myself to read French. So even though I wasn't doing particularly well in school, I was inclined towards studying, and I was always reading and didn't yeah. hang out with the guys. I was always reading and stuff. And he knew all that. And he said, um, Jones, if you want to re-enlist, I'll recommend you. But you don't belong in the Navy. You belong in school. Wow. And that was that was a life changing moment. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was the first. It was the first time anybody had ever said anything like that to me before. <coughs> and that really that was a life changing incident there. So both of us yeah. are here with tears yeah. in our eyes now. So it makes you. Uh, yeah. So that when you go, all of a sudden you're a different person. You're not. Yeah. The guy who with the F. You're the guy who belongs in school. Not only and I, and I once I. Went to California State University within a month. Uh, I've been in school ever since. I mean, yeah. I've never left. That was 1990. Yeah. So that's interesting. We, yeah. you know, we have very different experiences, but this this experience certainly of having that interaction with the authority who showed some vote of confidence. Yeah. yeah in us and it's a life-changing life-changing event well don i really appreciate you taking the time to share these stories thank you well you're welcome thanks for the opportunity